illustrator. And being an illustrator was what Norman Rockwell wanted to do. Those two people are that lady right in the middle of the photograph, his mom, and then his grandmother. They both encouraged him very, very vehemently to go into uh, field, the field of art and to become an illustrator. And Norman Rockwell's dad, who we can see seated there, worked in a textile mill, but sort of on the side liked to paint pictures too. So he was encouraged again by both of his parents, but more by mom and grandma. So they had a pretty ordinary lifestyle. Um, dad worked outside the home, mom stayed home to take care of those two kids. Um, while they lived in New York City, they moved to a number of different um, rooming houses. Um, they didn't own their own home until they moved to uh, New Rochelle, New York. And in New Rochelle, it gave Norman Rockwell an opportunity to meet a very famous illustrator. And his name was J.C. Leyendecker. And Leyendecker was America's favorite illustrator during his lifetime. And Norman Rockwell met him when Rockwell was a young man. As a matter of fact, he said he would see Leyendecker walking in the streets of New Rochelle and would try and mimic his walk, hoping it would improve his own illustration art. So we try now to find ways to connect our subjects to our audience. And this image right here from 1920, we can see what's happening there. These two folks are disagreeing about the election. Now, a couple of years ago, people might be surprised to see that this is the anniversary of the first time women got to vote nationally in the United States. And we can see they're each representing two, representing different candidates. He has uh, Cox's information in his hand in the newspaper. She has Harding's information in her hand. Of course, Harding from Ohio um, and the successful candidate who had selected um, a Massachusetts politician become his vice president. As all of you remember, uh, that, that's uh, Silent Cal, um, as people would refer to him. So there's, an, I thought, an interesting connection between the two areas but also an important image. When we think about the civil rights mo movement, I often think about the 60s, at least that's what I used to think about, until I started to look more carefully at Norman Rockwell's work and I realized that he's actually talking about civil rights and human rights in 1920. Um, you can see this, the image next to that slide, that is not a Norman Rockwell image. And the image is um, asking whether or not you want your wife to be at home with your child, taking care of your child, or out on the street um, trying to encourage people to vote. So we see here is the most of the people looking at this imagery would see um, the women voting as a negative thing. And what we're seeing on Rockwell's images is we can see women um, as a, an equal partner in this debate on who should become president. So Norman Rockwell was very interested in women's uh, rights and also reflected and reflected that through most of his career. We'll see a little bit later on in Norman Rockwell's images, some of the civil rights images, some of the other civil rights images he created. So here we have Norman Rockwell, an average guy at this point in his lifetime. He'd already worked for the Post for four years. He was a very successful illustrator at that point and didn't need to curry favor to one side or the other. So I really give Rockwell a lot of credit for showing the other side of women's suffrage. So very pertinent. And last year, of course, that 100th anniversary um, was celebrated in many different ways. But proud kind of that Norman Rockwell thought, here's an opportunity for me to tell a little bit more of the story. Rockwell also concentrated on other folks that didn't have the opportunity to speak up. And I'll let you take a look at this image for just a moment. And you'll see it's a Native American who's just gone to the mailbox to open a letter. And on that letter, it says, see America first. And you'll notice the date. We're right in the middle of the 1930s, middle, middle to late 1930s. And this is the time when the United States had promised the Native Americans that they would put schools on all the reservations where they were living, which the federal government did put schools there, but they didn't really support the schools. And they created situations where the Native Americans didn't get that much access to education, at least didn't get what they were promised. And I really give Rockwell a lot of credit for highlighting this at a point in time when there were other things going on, going around politically and economically. We're in the middle of the Great Depression. And here's Rockwell giving an opportunity for someone to say, you might want to stop for a moment and think about what we're all assuming. So this is Rockwell in the 1930s commenting on Native Americans. 
Now these two images, um, I'm sorry, my slide's a little big here, so I'll apologize for that. Um, these, this is a pencil sketch that Norman Rockwell did of a Saturday evening post cover. And the post cover actually is an image of the Liberty Girl. And Liberty Girl is an image that was created in uh, 1943. And you can see in Rockwell's pencil sketch, he has her pretty much in the same pose, the same walk, doesn't have the straight pants or the, uh, the starred top, but he does have a couple of small uh, images that you can notice uh, on this, uh, on the middle of that, the pencil sketch. One is the swastika, and then you also might notice, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a rising sun uh, just above her head. The Saturday Evening Post felt it was a little too much to have those two images in the image on the cover of the magazine. So Norman Rockwell agreed and altered the image slightly by bringing, um, excuse me, by bringing us, I'm just gonna try and see if I can move this over just a little bit, by bringing us an image that shows a very proud, hardworking woman who is taking on all these different roles. You might notice uh, in the background, there's a red lantern, probably meaning she did work on the railroad, as women did. Teaching, you can see the books um, just behind her knee there. You can see milk delivery, stenography. Um, you can see farming. Um, you can see an oil can across the uh, beginning of the front of the image, sorry. And you can also see that she has a wrench in her hand. So we're seeing as Norman Rockwell giving us this opportunity to appreciate what women are doing um, during the war years. I'm just gonna try and slide that over just a little bit. Um, so what we do see is that Norman Rockwell understood all the roles that women had and wanted to make sure that they were highlighted. All right, so I don't know how many of you have seen this image before, but this is not Norman Rockwell's painting of the, in the Sistine Chapel of the prophet Isaiah, but it is an image that Rockwell used to inspire another image that he created to help us show another uh, female image that has become very iconic. Uh, so iconic that not only are there organizations still around um, for Rosie the Riveters and Rosie the Riveter families and appreciators, there's also an ice hockey team that has this name. And we can see this image right here, which came directly from the image we just looked at a moment ago. This is Rosie the Riveter. Norman Rockwell painted this image in the early 1940s. It was published on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post in May, 1943. And if you look very carefully at the image, you'll see some things that might be a little surprising. If we're looking right near the top of the image, uh, right by that uh, bun of red hair, you can see she has a shield that will protect her face when she is riveting. Um, she also has a halo above her head, giving her the opportunity to be a saint. You probably noticed in the previous image that the prophet Isaiah wasn't sainted. We also noticed that she's having a little bit of lunch there. She has a sandwich that she's eating. Right near that sandwich, we can see some buttons across her overalls. Um, the first one is a red cross. And I'll just break from my usual uh, talk here and just mention that I was really fortunate a number of years ago, uh, which gotta be 15 or maybe 20 years ago, I had the opportunity to interview a number of women who were war workers, who were Rosie the Riveters, basically. And it was fascinating to talk to them and hear about the challenges they had and, and about how they, many of them took this in stride. Um, they were doing jobs that uh, would usually, men would usually have to apprentice with for a year. They might get two weeks worth of training to do these kinds of jobs. And they did everything from building airplanes um, and setting records, building those airplanes to um, testing machinery and testing munitions. And they just had to keep the military, um, the, 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 I'm sorry, the industry working no matter what that industry was. So here we see, again, this woman very proud of her work, knowing it's important. She has that rivet gun across her lap. And rivets, stuff, for those of you who don't know, are it's just another way to hold usually two pieces of metal together. Today, we might see them in our blue jeans in the corners of our pockets, holding those blue jean pockets on. Um, but that's what Rosie the Riveter would have done, one of the jobs. We can see her lunchbox on her knee. And I just remembered, I forgot to go through the rest of the buttons there. There's another button right next to that uh, red cross. And that's a, a blue star inside of a red square, which means red rectangle, I'm sorry, which means that she has somebody in her family who's in the military. 
She has a victory button. She has the large button right there. I don't know if you can see that, but right above her forearm, that's her work permit. And that would have allowed her to be on the floor of the factory where she was working. So we follow the, uh, the line from behind the, um, at the, I'm sorry, at the end of the uh, riveter. And that leads us down to her feet. And we look very carefully, we can see a copy of Mein Kampf, Adolf Hitler's book. And she has her feet resting very soundly on that. Um, one of the times when we see Rockwell using a reference that will help us figure out a little bit more of the story. And certainly if we look at her face, we see that she's confident in the fact that she will be our secret weapon, if you will. The woman that posed for this was a 19 year old telephone operator who lived in Vermont where Rockwell was living when he painted this image. And she never saw the image when it was, before it was published in the cover of the magazine, which was typical for models who posed for Norman Rockwell. So when she came in after this was published in May, 1943, uh, all of her coworkers said, hey, Mary, Mary Keith was her name, Hey Mary, show us your muscles. And she wasn't sure what was going on until they showed her the cover of the Saturday Evening Post. So there's Rosie the Riveter, and you might recognize that image. There's also the We Can Do It Girl, which came out at about the same time, and they often get used interchangeably. But there are two opportunities that two uh, male illustrators took to show the importance of women's work during the 1940s. I'll also tell um, you- can, um, I, can I interrupt you with just a couple questions? Oh, One, absolutely. Um, so One of the questions is, can you address the process which Norman would have used to create illustrations for the post? Was he allowed to suggest images or did he create from directives? What media did he use? And the other is, what is the meaning of the swastika and the rising sun? Or Excellent. I'm going to start with the easiest question first, which is what media did he use? Oil paint. Um, oil paint, he did use watercolors for a couple of his ads, but mostly watercolor, mostly oil paint is what he used to create these images. Um, I'll answer the question about um, Rockwell suggesting ideas for the post, and that is what he did. He would send them an idea, uh, usually a, a sketch of what he wanted to do on the cover. They would okay it and might make some changes to it, and he would go ahead and make those changes. And I'll tell you a story a little later on about an image that he didn't change and what happened to that one. Um, Rockwell, when he referenced uh, those two images I mentioned before, um, let me see if my computer will allow me to go back to that picture. So right here, and I'll use my, uh, my mouse to show you. The swastika was an image that was taken over by the Nazis in Germany to represent uh, their movement there. Um, on the top part of the image right around in here, you can see a rising sun, which was the image of the Japanese empire um, during World War II, um, which had been used in many different ways previous and has been used afterwards as well. Um, I think those are the questions. Um, his process was a, a pretty straightforward, but a long process. He would start um, usually with a blank piece of paper. I'm gonna go back to Rosie. Um, he would start with a blank piece of paper and if he had trouble coming up with an idea, he'd draw a lamppost. And next to the lamppost, he would draw a person. Then he might draw another person. Then he might draw a dog. And then he might draw a kid. And pretty soon, the lamppost would disappear, and Marco would have the story he wanted to tell. So that's how he started. A sketch about the size of a 3 by 5 index card. Some were a little larger. Most of them were smaller than that. After that was done, it was going to the post. They, he would suggest the idea to the post. They would OK, maybe make some suggestions. Then Marco would start by um, trying to get some models together, having a photographer take pictures of the models. He'd cut those photographs up and take out the pieces of the photographs that he'd like. He'd reassemble those together, um, sometimes take a photograph of that, sometimes work right from those bits and pieces of photographs. He would then do a pencil sketch. I'll go back to um, Liberty Girl. There's a pencil sketch. That's just pencil and a piece of paper uh, that Rockwell's working with. Um, <clears throat> Once that was done, he would then do a color study, a full size, usually full size oil painting, and then do the finished work. I mean, most illustrators feel that the work that appears on the cover of the magazine in Rockwell's case, or in an ad, that was the final piece, not the painting. So it was a process that would take Rockwell quite a bit of time. It took him between three to six months to do each painting. 
All right, and we're going to move a little further into the war years. Um, here we are with the four freedoms. Um, Rockwell created the image of freedom of speech, the man with the brown coat on, looking up at the person who's in charge of the meeting, addressing his topic. Um, you might be able to see in his pocket, he actually has a um, has the mailer that went out to him that told him what was going on, what the agenda was for that meeting. You can see the cover of it in the man's hand with the dove-colored suit in the foreground. So it's left in, leaving us imagining that he read through, found out something that was going on that evening and wanted to express his opinion about it. And we can see Norman Rockwell in the, in the background. Oh, my, he's right back here. And Rockwell actually was inspired to do this image because he was at a town meeting and one of his neighbors wanted to do something different than what most of the people in town wanted to do. And so Rockwell thought that might be a good way to show us freedom of speech. And this was the, this is the final work as it was published. There are a number of studies that were done of this image. Right next to that one is the second of the four freedoms. These were all mentioned by President Roosevelt, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt that is in uh, 1941 in what would become called uh, the Four Freedom Speech. Um, it was the uh, speech delivered near the beginning of the year in 1941. So freedom of, freedom of worship right next door to freedom of speech, um, we can see is each according to the dictates of his own conscience. And Rockwell when asked said he wasn't sure where he had heard that quote before, but thought maybe somewhere in Europe or somewhere else, he wasn't sure. Um, we found out that as we looked through um, documentation, that it's in a number of state constitutions and it is referenced in a number of different uh, governmental um, edicts in different parts of Europe. So we're not, we weren't really sure where it came from either, but it was a great way to show that no matter who you are, what you worship, when you worship, that you should have that opportunity to worship the way you want to. And so these four images were originally offered to the federal government, the government turned them down, and they became essay illustrations in the Saturday Evening Post. Here are the other two. So freedom from want is the one with the big turkey. So a lot of people just call it the turkey picture, and there it is. Uh, some of you have might have even seen this image parodied uh, quite often, um, and uh, it's kind of a fun topic to uh, to delve into the parodies of Rockwell's work. Because we look down that that table, what we notice maybe is that we're sitting at the head of the table and people are looking at us, welcoming us to sit down. There's food and plenty of uh, entertainment to go around with the, the family there. And the woman holding the turkey, believe it or not, is actually Nora Rockwell's cook. The man standing next to her wasn't her husband, but Nora Rockwell thought that man looked more like her husband than her actual husband. So Norman Rockwell definitely had a sense of what he wanted and when he wanted to create the image and who was going to play those characters. So again, Rockwell gives us that chance to be at this table um, to celebrate an opportunity to have family together. The final one is freedom from fear. And Rockwell creates an image with a newspaper right in the middle so you can tell what's going on here, it helps us clue into the subject that's being talked about. Rockwell shows the two kids in bed um, together asleep. Not unusual in the 1940s that you'd have to share living space. Oftentimes families were uh, moved together um, to try and save on expenses from the Great Depression the years before. And some folks, that was the way that they, they lived. We do see, as we look through this room, a little bit of light reflecting off the picture that's hanging in that uh, alcove. And that just lets us know that there isn't a, a curtain over the window. Had there been a curtain over the window, it might have indicated that there was something to be very concerned about outside. Maybe there was a blackout that evening, but we're not seeing that here. If I'll direct your attention now, I'll direct your attention actually to the bottom part of the image right down here. And you can see that there's a doll on the floor and that doll is looking directly up at the family. I'd like to think that maybe the brother and sister felt so comfortable that they were asleep together in the bed that they didn't need to have the doll with them. We can also see that the little boy uh, probably has left his robe on the floor and there's a block also on the floor. So letting us know that even though our parents and grandparents continue to tell us that they were all neat and tidy through their whole lives, here we can see in 1943 that sometimes kids' rooms were a mess. 
Rockwell, as the war concluded, started to show images that um, showed more of everyday scenes again. And here we are in 1949, Rockwell creates this image called Tough Call. And we see the three umpires there trying to figure out if this game that's being held at Ebbets Field is gonna continue. We have the Pittsburgh Pirates and the Brooklyn Dodgers playing this game, what looks like a rainy day in some parts and a sunny day in others. And they're just trying to figure out what the next step is. So two, two things here to notice. One, notice that the button on the hat of the Brooklyn Dodger uh, player, the, I'm sorry, manager, is actually dark as dark blue. Originally when Rocco painted it was white. Um, the post realized that the button actually was supposed to be blue, so painted that over. And when we look at the grass at the bottom of the image, the grass was actually a little bit longer when Norman Rocco painted it. And the post had somebody cut the grass, if you will, paint the grass a little bit lower down. And the ads in the background were actual ads that were in Ebbets Field. Those were changed also, so the post wouldn't be giving free advertisement to uh, other companies that hadn't paid for advertising. So those are kind of some funny and anecdotal things about the picture that you're looking at. What you're probably wondering is why is there a picture of a Brooklyn Dodger standing up um, by himself on the top corner? That's a photograph, not a Norman Rockwell painting, but it's a photograph of a second baseman. Um, his name was Jackie Robinson, and his number was 42, as you can see on his uniform. And I've taken um, a little bit of liberty with the image by showing us um, in this bottom corner here that that scoreboard has Jackie Robinson coming up to bat and he'll be next after the left fielder. This is kind of a fun thing that I noticed uh, a number of years ago and actually pointed out to the Baseball Hall of Fame who are actually the owners of this painting. So Norman Rockwell in 1949 was realizing and helping us understand that changes were happening in our culture. Tom, would you mind going back one um, before that to the um, that one? Yes. So there's a question. What's in the middle of the fruit on the table? Can you see that? Oh, great. Yeah, the middle of the fruit. So we have a, a grouping of fruit there that um, is actually painted in a monochromatic way, which helps us see the fruit, but doesn't overwhelm the image. Right behind it, there's a terrine with might have gravy, or I'm hoping it's potatoes. But we don't. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. So uh, also in the 1940s, one of the things that people were looking at was the Statue of Liberty. And there were many, many people that did covers for the Saturday Evening Post that showed the Statue of Liberty. When Rocco was uh, encouraged to do one, this is what he showed. He showed the crown and the arm with the torch being held up high. And then he showed a group of men working on that torch. Now the Saturday Evening Post had an unwritten rule and the unwritten rule was you shouldn't put someone of color on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post unless they were in a position of servitude. So what we're looking at here is a little bit of equality that Rockwell is showing. All four of these guys, five, there's actually somebody in the background and six, one guy lowering a, that pail down. The guys that are working on the torch itself are all are of different races. And Mark was showing them tending to liberty, literally in this case, um, as equals. And a lot of people wonder what happens to these paintings. You know, the Norman Rockwell Museum has quite a few of them, but there are also many Norman Rockwell pictures all over the country and in different parts of the world. The painting that you're seeing that Saturday evening post that was tried from that, uh, from the, the painting, I'm sorry, um, that created that helped create that cover is actually hanging in that office. You can see it right there behind a statue that was done by Remington. And what you might notice as you look near the bottom of that uh, image is that the uh, wainscoting is actually rounded. That's because the where that painting hung was in the Oval Office during President Obama's um, uh, time in office. It also hung in the White House during the Clinton administration as well. It was a gift to the White House um, in, uh, in that time period. So one of Norman Rockwell's paintings is actually in the collection of the White House, which is very exciting. Uh, fun fact, you can wow your neighbors with this next time you see them. The sculpture that was done by Remington right in front of that, that sculptor actually had a studio in a city called New Rochelle, New York. And that studio many, many years later was actually used by Norman Rockwell and Clyde Forsyth. They shared that studio space in New Rochelle. 
So just kind of a fun fact there that uh, you can uh, wow your neighbors with. Rockwell in the 1940s also showed some of the other ordinary things that were happening, something that was much more ordinary than I would have ever imagined were young people traveling by train. And many of them were traveling by train, especially in New England to go to private schools. And maybe that's what this little boy is doing right here. Maybe he's traveling to private school. But if we start to look more carefully at what's going on in the image, we notice there's a gentleman there who's working for probably the Pullman Car Company. Um, his name would have been George. And the only reason that we can be sure of that is that all of the porters that worked for the Pullman Company that uh, waited on folks, they were all called George. They weren't allowed to use their real name. The little boy right there, we can see he's looking very carefully at his bill. And maybe for lunch, we can see what he's had. If we look really carefully toward the middle of the image, we can see that he had, um, yep, the chocolate cupcake. And then just behind that, I'm get my cursor to work again. Oops, it's not cooperating. There we go. Right back there, there's an ice cream dish. And I think anyone would probably choose that for lunch if they had the opportunity. Uh, this little boy's trying to figure out if he has enough money to maybe pay his bill or leave a tip. We can see his coin purse in his hand. And for some reason, in the mid-1940s when this image was done, he didn't have his iPhone with him, so he had to bring a comic book, and we can see that in his pocket. So go back to the, uh, the man working there. Uh, for African Americans, the job of working as a Pullman porter um, was a job that paid pretty well. It was uh, an opportunity for people to travel, but it was still an, it was still seen as a position that was uh, subservient to many, uh, unfortunately. Uh, interestingly enough, um, Robert Todd Lincoln, who was Abraham Lincoln's son, ended up running the Pullman Car Company. And if any of you have a chance to go to Vermont and see uh, uh, Hill Dean, and visit uh, that area, you'll have an opportunity to find out a little bit more about um, what they've done to help tell the story of the Pullman Porters. It's a quite, a, quite an interesting experience if you ever have a chance to get to Hill Dean. Now, Norman Rockwell in 1959, what he wanted to do was to show the diversity that's in America. And if you look at the very bottom of the image, you'll see there's a pirate and what looks like a princess of some sort. And then we'll walk through American history. We get to the pre-colonial area, the colonial era, um, the early uh, 1800s with that gentleman with the gray hat and the woman with the green hat. Um, the next, uh, the first branch we see uh, a Confederate soldier and a Union soldier. Um, we then move forward in the timeline to the beginnings of the 20th century. Um, we see a religious revival being mentioned. We see the expansion westward in the, uh, again, in the uh, late, later half of the 1800s. We move a little further up. We see a couple that looks like they're the epitome of the Great Gatsby. Um, we see a little bit more of the Western influence in, in dress across the image. In, the, in 1959, when the picture was created, we see what would look like a typical couple um, a red-haired woman and dark-haired man having a red-headed son for their offspring. Uh, Rockwell's hope with this picture was actually that he would show more diversity, but his sons discouraged him from doing that. Um, they, wanted, uh, I beg your pardon, they wanted more diversity, and Rockwell actually said, I, this is about as far as I can go with this. I can't really push it any further because the Post wasn't interested in showing diverse images. Okay, in 1959, they weren't in, interested in that. Rockwell was also very uh, good to show that um, he created a timeline here that's actually a, a straight family tree, which I guess is a little troublesome. But anyway, Norman Rockwell includes himself in the middle of the image. And if you look very carefully at the picture, you might notice that there's a trait that's carried through all of the characters. And I'm gonna move my cursor right to this young woman here. Um, notice her nose and eyes. And then we see those same nose and eyes here. We see the same nose and eyes here. We see the same nose and eyes here. And so what Rockwell did was to show that that trait brought through all the family. And Norman Rockwell used a man named Frank Dolson to pose for um, all of the characters that have that same consistent facial feature. So Norman Rockwell tried the best that he could to make some changes 
And it really wouldn't take hold until Rockwell started to break ties with the Saturday Evening Post. Now in 1954, Rockwell created this pencil sketch and we can see um, the uh, United Nations flag and some representatives from the USSR, the United Kingdom and the United States all sitting there as all the world's people behind them are wondering what they're gonna do, what their next move is. So it's old and young, male and female, um, it's different um, races and religions. Rockwell is showing a cross section of people here. Rockwell um, worked on this image for quite a number of years, put it aside, and then realized that maybe there was more opportunity for this not to necessarily be a Saturday evening post cover, but to possibly be um, an image that might relate more to the uh, United Nations. It was offered to the United Nations. They weren't that interested in it. And so Rockwell decided maybe there's another way I can use this, altered the image a little bit, added the two hands clasping, started to work in the ideas of having maybe some lettering at the bottom, and then created this picture. And here we are in 1961. Uh, this did become a cover of the Saturday Evening Post as their editorial bent had changed in the 1950s and into the early 60s. And Rockwell shows uh, a number of different people from all over the different all over the world, um, all looking at do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now Rockwell didn't just think of this off the top of his head. Of course, he did research to find out if there was a common topic um, across um, ways of life throughout the world, and did find this. He had help from Eric Erickson, um, who was also studying this idea as well at the same time and was also working in Stockbridge um, at a clinic there. So Rockwell really felt that this could be a good way to show how we could all be together and we could all have this common bond. Now, if you look very carefully in the top corner part of the picture, and I'll go up there, um, you can see this lady with the white collar right here, hopefully. Um, that's Norman Rockwell's wife, Mary. Unfortunately, she died in 1959, so before this image was created. And the little child that's with her would have been their first grandchild, grandchild. Unfortunately, Mary died before the grandchild was born, so never had the opportunity to meet him. Um, and so Rockwell brought them together in this one image, an image that has international impact, but also connects us um, on that very, very human level. Rockwell throughout the 60s would reference many different um, images that might help us think about civil rights. Um, image of Lincoln um, defending uh, a family friend who had been accused of murder. If we look carefully, we'll notice that Lincoln is holding a copy of the Farmer's Almanac. The main part of the crime that was committed, the murder that was committed, was that the man was seen by the full moonlight and was given the date. So, of course, Lincoln could look back, find out what date that crime occurred, and let the jury know and let the judge know that there was no full moon that evening which would have acquitted um, his family friend of the crime. So <clears throat> Norman Rockwell was referencing in the 1960s um, characters that have been looked at as very important um, icons in uh, the civil rights movement. Um, Kennedy uh, here shown um, after, uh, unfortunately after uh, Kennedy's assassination, this image is from the late 1960s and it's harkening back to Kennedy um, setting up uh, the Peace Corps and we can see it's all different types of people who are involved in the Peace Corps, young people changing the approach to things, um, making our society a little bit more accessible um, for many. Tom? I'm sorry, Lynn. Yeah, this is Paul Duffy. Oh, Paul. Do you mind if I ask you a question at this point? Not at all. It's kind of a two-parter. Okay. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about what, how, how would you speculate that coming from the apparently privileged and very white background that he came from, what might've been some of the motivators for Rockwell to become at least visibly or, or artistically involved in, in social justice? And then the, the related question is, did, these, did some or any of these paintings create a controversy along with the acclaim? Oh, great questions. Thanks, Paul. So the, the First question about uh, Rockwell, why he might feel moved to do images like this, is because Rockwell felt he was kind of an outsider himself and felt like um, he maybe didn't, he wasn't in sync with everyone. 
And, and I think he saw the fact that people like the women's movement, um, like the Native Americans, African Americans, um, I think he felt some kinship with them, not feeling like they were part of the in-group. And I certainly think that that helped him think about ways to highlight um, some of their struggles. And he certainly didn't show all of the struggles and certainly didn't go into great details um, with all of the struggles. And again, working for the Saturday Evening Post, which he did for about 47 years, that uh, kind of narrowed down some of the things he could do. And once he started, when he worked with other companies, he tried to do a little bit more. And I'll talk about that later on. And I will, um, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the controversy as we get through some of the um, last few images. Um, so I don't mean to put you off, but I will talk about those in just a moment. No, that's great, thank you. You're welcome, Paul. <clears throat> the image you're looking at is actually um, the Main Street Soccer from Massachusetts in 1967, 1963, I'm sorry, I got my dates wrong, 1973. It's Norman Rockwell in the lead bicycle with the blue shirt and the tan pants, his wife, Molly, his third wife with the white top and the red skirt, um, riding their bikes with a couple of friends of theirs in the middle of Stockbridge. So we all know in the 1960s that things were just like this. So everything was peaceful and fine and no one had concerns, right? Well, maybe they did. Um, and we're gonna start to see the next few images are gonna have uh, images not dissimilar for what we're looking at right here, some graphic images about events that happened in the 1960s. Um, here we see a painting that Rockwell, um, that it's called Southern Justice. Uh, we can see a little bit of Rockwell's work beforehand, that page with all the sketches on it. And yes, Rockwell had bad handwriting. Um, all those little notes, the date that the event took place, um, these were the three civil rights workers that were murdered in Mississippi, uh, in Philadelphia, Mississippi. And Rockwell's fi finding out everything from the temperature, what kind of clay was there, um, when did it happen, what the shadows might look like. Uh, right up here, we have the three men that were murdered, Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman. Um, we have Rockwell referencing other pieces of art to um, see which shadows might play. We have Rockwell himself actually using, um, we believe it to be blood, um, showing what the smear might look like on a white shirt. There's a Pulitzer Prize winning photograph um, that's uh, right there in the middle of the screen, right here. Um, and that was taken in Central America uh, right around the same time the event happened. Um, in the early 60s. And then right here, there's a, um, right next door, there's a, an image of uh, some folks that were inju injured during a protest. So the image that Rockwell paints is the larger, clearer image um, that's in full color on the side of your uh, screen there. And that's the three men as they're in the middle of being murdered. Of course, Rockwell didn't know any of the details until he did his research, was asked to paint an image that would go along with a story called Southern Justice, which talked about the inequity in the civil, in the uh, justice system in, in the South. Uh, after that uh, being said, the, when they look, looked at the image, they didn't want the, that harsh image. They ended up using a study that you can see right here. Um, that's how it looked. That's actually what the magazine looked like. It's actually a photograph of the magazine um, with that story in it. And the story goes into details about um, the numbers of uh, African Americans imprisoned um, for crimes and the numbers of uh, people who weren't African Americans being set free. Um, this image caused a lot of controversy. Um, it certainly created an opportunity for people to write to Rockwell and cancel subscriptions to the Saturday Evening Post, even though it wasn't in the Saturday Evening Post. Um, he received an awful lot of hate mail, but he also received letters of people congratulating him on showing things the way they actually are. Um, did, did the post routinely back up the front page image with commentary regarding the issue? Oh, that's a great question. So the Saturday evening post, um, what they would do is the image would be on the cover. There would be a small block inside that would say this image painted by Norman Rockwell. And it shows three umpires debating what, whether the game was going to be called because of rain or not. Um, the image I just showed you was actually a story illustration that would be inside another magazine called Look. Um, so they did comment, but it, it usually wasn't anything more than a couple of sentences. Thank you. You're welcome. So in 1960, uh, when Ruby Bridges is selected to go to the William Friends Elementary School, 
um, Rockwell's asked to, to um, create an image. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in some detail. These are black and white photographs from the time of Ruby going into school, coming out of the school, and some of the protesters that didn't want her in that school. Now, the asked for the image actually came um, a couple of years after this happened. And the ask was to create an image that would show us, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, an image that would help us think about Brown versus the Board of Education, which happened 10 years previous to the event that took place with Ruby Bridges. And this is what Norman Rockwell creates. He creates this painting called The Problem We All Live With. And we can see it's a young girl walking to school. Uh, Rockwell has changed her outfit. She's now wearing all white instead of the two-tone dress that Ruby Bridges had. She, <clears throat> excuse me, she has four US Marshals around her. We can clearly see there's a racial slur written on the wall. And then just in front of the marshals, we can see a reference to the Ku Klux Klan, a hate organization that was started just after the American Civil War and still continues to this day. We also notice on this side of the image that there's been a tomato that's been thrown up this wall and splattered here. And it gives us a little bit of depth to notice that there's a ridge there as parts of that tomato are left hanging on that ridge, if you will. We do see Ruby Bridges, uh, the image that reminds us of Ruby Bridges looking straight forward. And what we know from Ruby Bridges herself is that her mother said that if you get concerned or get worried, just say your prayers and say your prayers to the people who don't understand why you're trying to go to school. It's a very confident look she he has on her face and an image that has been referenced many, many times throughout our, uh, not only Rockwell's life, but even after Rockwell's life. I did have the opportunity to ask uh, ask Norman Rockwell's son, why did his father paint his name so large at the bottom of the picture? And, and you can see it right down here in the lower case. And Peter Rockwell told me he painted his name so large on the picture because Norman Rockwell wanted people to know that this was something that bothered him. And so there's a little bit more <clears throat> information on that painting. There's Linda Gunn, the model that posed for the little girl. In the picture, she was part of a family that Rockwell was very close friends with, and the guns appeared in a number of Norman Rockwell's work, and there she is a couple of years after she posed, for sure. Um, she ended up uh, staying in Berkshire County um, for her, her, her entire life. I found this other picture of Sasha and Malia Obama walking to school in DC to their private school and saw some, um, some connections there. The image in the bottom corner, um, you might recognize President Obama. There's the original painting, which hung just outside of President Obama's Oval Office in the White House. And the woman next to him looking at him is actually Ruby Bridges Hall, the little girl that inspired this image. President Obama said that if it wasn't for what Ruby Bridges went through, she, he probably wouldn't be president. And this was the first opportunity the president had to meet Ruby Bridges Hall in the White House. The next image on this slide is an image from November of last year, and it's it was originally called Good Trouble, um, created by Brina Goler and um, commissioned by Gordon Jones. And Jones owned the, um, the website called Good Trouble and published this in November. And if we look very carefully, we see Vice, the Vice President Harris there, and then the shadow she's creating is actually a shadow of uh, Ruby Bridges behind her, the image from Problem We All Live With. And um, I, I believe it was said once that uh, Vice President Harris thought that um, that might be her, um, as she said very famously during the presidential debates. Um, amazing to think that this image, which was inside a magazine once um, in, without even a story attached to it in 1964, could have this amount of length, and even though it's uh, fit more than 50 years later on, we still see that picture uh, on routine, uh, routinely in our, our political cartoons and in, in our references. And it's been used many, many different ways. So important to see that Rockwell still has relevance today. In 1967, Rockwell created this image also for Look Magazine, um, showing that times are changing again. As we see this family moving into the neighborhood, we can see all their belongings that are being unloaded from the van. See the man just unloading the uh, truck, not paying attention to what's going on. The kids 
are sort of sizing up um, kids as kids will, wondering if they now have another player for their baseball team. Notice the gloves the two boys on one side are holding and the catcher's mitt that the other boy has just behind him. We also see that the little girls, um, the young girl with the cat has a pink bow in her hair and the other girl with the gray uh, sweatshirt on has a pink ribbon in her hair. So Rockwell's find fond ways of common um, experiences um, for all five of these kids. We do notice though that the white cat and the black dog don't look like they're gonna get along, um, but instead of Rockwell doing the ordinary showing the aggressive dog, he shows the aggressive cat and he shows the dog being more passive. Maybe a good reminder that we should look at the situation that's in front of us and not make an assumption. Rockwell in the 1970s uh, created this image to help celebrate the bicentennial. Uh, unfortunately, it was never finished. So what Rockwell did is he created an image that showed Chief Conkapot, an actual um, uh, Native American that lived in Stockbridge, making an agreement with John Sargent. And John Sargent actually had um, decided to create a school to help uh, educate the Native Americans. And he took one step, took it one step for, forward. He actually went back to Yale where he had been studying, brought Opechi and uh, Kankapot down to Yale with him and learned their language and wrote a dictionary for them to have uh, of their, their language written word, which is still uh, being used by the Muncie uh, Indians in North Central uh, Wisconsin, the United States. We can see as we look carefully at this image, not everyone was happy about the fact that there would be a Native American school in their home. And that's Mrs. Sargent in the background looking kind of grumpy about the fact that her way of life is going to change. Rockwell in 1969 created this image. He was asked by the federal government to do it. The Bureau of Land Reclamation asked them to paint this picture. They were trying to encourage people to go out to uh, the Glen Canyon Dam and use uh, the recreation facilities they were creating out there and celebrate the fact that we now had a hydroelectric dam out in that area. And Marco went out there, met the people that were living near this dam and realized that they weren't consulted and probably didn't really feel very good about losing more of their land um, here. So what Rockwell did was to paint this image to show the reaction that the three people had and the dog and the horse um, to this dam being built there. Um, the government accepted the picture after Rockwell um, had painted it. They were going to use it for promotion and then they realized that the image didn't really promote what they were hoping for. So they kept the picture. It's actually in a visitor center um, out near uh, Page, Arizona. So this is a painting that Rockwell did in 1969 as we're getting um, closer to the end of his life. Rockwell also created this graphic image um, here. And uh, he was inspired, uh, as you can see the photograph at the bottom, to use live models, as I mentioned before. He's also using a piece of art from 1864 painted by Manet. And this is what he creates from those reference points. Two pictures called Blood Brothers, and they were meant to be story illustrations um, for a magazine. As we get near the end of our presentation, this is an image that was done in 1968 and it's called the right to know. And again, we can see much like the image for the um, golden rule, we have all sorts of different people represented here and they've come to the seat of authority and there's no one there to answer their questions. No one there to talk about what's going on in the world or in their country. And they're left um, at odds, uh, wondering what they should do next. So Rockwell definitely had a keen uh, understanding of what people were going through during the 1960s. And this is a quick uh, article, um, and, and you certainly can read it if you want to take a moment to read the snippet. It was published in 1965 um, as Rockwell had an exhibition um, out in Los Angeles. Tom, it's Paul Duffy again. I, I noticed that in the in the t last two or three that you showed, uh, the images of the uh, Native American in the in the room with the uh, uh, the oh. colonial and the, um, the th that landscape, there's a really different focus away from faces and 
and emotions and more toward kind of a, a very different way of looking at space and landscape, or at least it appears to me. Yeah, excellent observation. Uh, Rockwell not looking at what the one individual story is, he's looking at a little bit bigger picture in this one and definitely in this one. That opportunity to see that there's more out there than just what's happening to individuals, that these individuals are being affected by um, what people are doing and often not being considered. I'll go back if anyone wanted to finish reading. Sorry, I forgot to, I forgot the two as be reading that. <laughs> Pay your pardon. All right, I'm going to zip to the next slide and uh, we're just about done. I am happy to take any questions that you may have if you have any left. Um, I uh, also can uh, I also can be reached uh, by email if you have any questions uh, for me specifically, happy to answer them um, for you. So thank you very, very much for the opportunity to spend some time with you today. And I look forward to uh, having you see me again. Thank you so much, Tom. We're, we'll be um, happy to invite you back. Thank you. We appreciate you being here with us today. There was one question from uh, Dick, and he wanted to know if you knew of Ben Prinz, who also did um, covers for the Post. And Dick, it happens to be his great nephew. Wondered if you knew of him. Uh, I'm sorry, could you say the name again? Ben Prinz, P-R-I-N-S. I, I have heard the name. I, I, I'll be honest, I, I can't call an image up right off the top of my head. Um, but the name is familiar to me. And the great thing is that um, Rockwell did 300 and, um, 323 Saturday evening post covers. Um, and he was he did the most. But there's some folks that only did one or two. Um, there's some folks that did 50 or 100. Um, so luckily, the post did pick from a very large uh, cauldron of folks that were, uh, that were working um, for the magazine. So I'm sorry that I can't call up the image immediately, though. Thank you. We thank you so much for being here with us today. It's been a, a really interesting presentation and I know that everyone appreciates lots of comments here, um, people thanking you for this presentation. So we'd love to have you back again. And thanks to everyone for joining us as well. We appreciate it. And we and hope that folks will come back uh, for our March 12th coffee hour, which will be focused on Women's History Month. So thanks to everyone. Thank all of you. I appreciate it today. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. You're welcome, Lynn. Thanks, Sue and Paul. You bet. Thank you so much. Sorry, I'm having trouble with the connection. Please try again in a moment. <laughs> Should we help me out? Yeah, just if you hang on just a minute. Oh, oh, oh happy to. I, I'm, I'm happy to stay here until we're all set. Great, thank you. I'll wait to be the last one to leave the room. <laughs> Lots of good comments, splendid presentation. Oh. Yeah, this is the only hard, hard thing uh, about this is you don't get an opportunity to talk with people afterwards. <laughs>